Can you remember a time when you were using some software and you asked yourself, does this have an exploitable bug in it? How do I know? How do I check? It's a question actually that's pretty commonly asked, and not just by developers who are trying to write software, but by end users like my mom when she calls me up on my phone and says, which application should I use? Should I use Internet Explorer or Google Chrome? What can I do to make sure the software I'm using is safe? And one way to go about answering this question is to hire a hacker. So let me introduce you to the world's best hacker, in my opinion. His name is Loki, and he is an expert at web browser security. At one point in time, Loki found new vulnerabilities and was able to exploit them in just three applications that would have enabled him to break into 85% of the computers in the world. It all started with a contest called Pwn to Own, where the rules are actually pretty simple. The people running the contest install a fully patched version of an operating system on a laptop, and then they install the latest, greatest, direct from developers version of a web browser. The goal? To break into the computer through the web browser. And if you think about it, this is pretty amazing, right? Because vendors spend a lot of money trying to secure their operating systems, and people like Google, for example, spend a lot of money on web browser security. But Loki has been studying computer security for a long time. He's been learning a lot about web browser security, how to hack, and he's an expert in the internals of Google Chrome. He sits down in front of the first laptop running Google Chrome, and within two minutes had found a new vulnerability and was able to exploit it. What's amazing is over the course of the next two days, he also found new zero days in Internet Explorer and Apple Safari. Those were the three bugs that would have allowed him to break into 85% of the world. Now, Loki is the world's best hacker, but he's not a criminal. I don't want to conflate the two terms, hacker and criminal. He responsibly disclosed those vulnerabilities to vendors, and those vendors issued updates that protected millions of people. Over the course of that weekend, Loki also made about $250,000, so it's not a bad career. But I ask you, if you think about it, think of all the software that you use every day. And I'm not just talking about the software that's running on your, on your laptop or on your mobile phone, but I'm also thinking about all the software that you interact on non-obvious devices, like IoT devices, your Wi-Fi router, even software that powers the safety system on your car. Who's checking it for security vulnerabilities? How do we go about doing what Loki does, where over a weekend he did three apps, but that's just three apps, and doing it at scale? For example, did you know on just the Google Play and Apple Store, a new app is released every 13 seconds? It's just amazing. How do we go about checking software at the sort of scale when a new one is written every 13 seconds? So I've been working on thinking about this problem for a long time, and myself with other academic researchers, have been puzzling over this question of what if we could teach computers to hack? What if we could take what Loki does and we could program computers to emulate it so that instead of relying upon human power alone to check for vulnerabilities, computers could do it for us? Now, I've been using this word exploit quite a bit, and I want to make sure that people understand what I mean. Here's a very simple program called IWConfig. It used to run on Linux systems, configure your wireless card to an access point. And it has a typical security flaw. It has a buffer overflow. Now, it doesn't take a lot of code to introduce a vulnerability. This program is only 1,400 lines long. We built a tool that takes off-the-shelf software, something that consumers and users can use without developer cooperation to audit software for security vulnerabilities. It's called Mayhem. So Mayhem takes IWConfig, it systematically explores the state space and outputs an exploit. And what I mean by an exploit is the noun, the thing. These funny digits are a working exploit where if you start off as an unprivileged user for all secure, and you take the output of our tool and directly give it as input to IWConfig, you get a root shell. So if you think about it, what I just showed you is a computer took software with no developer cooperation and was able to find a security vulnerability and prove it. This isn't the world that we live in today, but I think this is the world that we need to live in. One where not just developers can check for the security of applications, but anyone can. And just as importantly, we can do it at scale where we automate the process. So after we looked at this sort of problem on programs like IAW Config, we said, what sort of scale can we apply these techniques at? And in one study that we did, we looked at 37,391 programs. We took every Debian program available. 
and we spend three years of CPU time analyzing the programs. That amounts to five minutes, just five minutes per application. And we did this in an embarrassing parallel way. We just brought up a bunch of Amazon nodes and it only took us a month to, uh, a month to do. We found 2.6 million new crashes due to, as far as we could tell, 13,875 new bugs in those programs. Of those, 250 would allow me to get a shell, just like I showed you. This is the sort of scale that we want to be operating at, where we can check the world's software for exploitable bugs. And I can tell you, we can start doing analysis. Like, it cost me 28 cents for a new bug and $21 per exploit. Compare that to Loki, who made $250,000 for three vulnerabilities. We've been doing this research for over a decade, along with other researchers such as Giovanni Vigna at UCSB, Don Song at Berkeley, and a larger community. At one point, the community was looking at these sort of techniques and they thought there was a lot of promise. And someone stepped up to challenge the community to prove it in an open forum. That organization was DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. They issued what they called a cyber grand challenge. Essentially what they wanted to do is do for cyber what the autonomous driving challenge did for vehicles. They wanted to turn cyber into something that was completely autonomous and controlled by computers. They challenged the community to combine the speed and scale of automation with reasoning abilities that exceeded those of human experts. The first thing that they did is they wanted to make sure they got the best ideas out there. And so they off issued a BAA, an open call for proposals, where they announced that there will be a fully autonomous offense and defense contest at the end. And at the end of this contest, the winning solution would get a $2 million cash prize. That's a way for people to pay a lot of attention. And because of this broad outreach, they had over 100 US entities register for the Cyber Grand Challenge to try to compete to show fully autonomous offense and defense as possible. They ran this contest over two years. And in the first year, they had a down select where they had a public and mathematically checked approach for determining who the top seven contestants would be based upon a number of performance factors I'll talk about in a minute. And then in 2016, they ran a full spectrum attack in defense contest at DEF CON in front of 30,000 hackers. Now this hacking contest was quite different than ones that typically go on at DEF CON where it's human versus human. In this contest, it was computer versus computer. No humans allowed. They put those computers up on a stage, had a big air gap, and the computers fought it out. I want to tell you the story of that. So the way DARPA structured this contest is they first came up with programs and they sent them to all the contestants to go and find vulnerabilities and create patches that fix those vulnerabilities. So all the contestants would look through the code, they would run their technique, like I just showed you with Mayhem, they would find exploitable bugs, and then they would try to automatically patch the binary software to defend against those bugs. They'd send them back to DARPA, and DARPA would evaluate the security solutions based upon a number of factors. The first was, if you created an exploit, does it work against other people's binaries? If you think about it, what they're asking is a consensus evaluation. Well, when you come up with an exploit, if you can exploit other people's patches, that's worth more. And if you can't exploit other people's patches, you don't get points. Second, they evaluated the patch itself. So once you find a vulnerability, could you fix it? And they evaluated security if we submitted a patch by saying how many people could exploit us. But the world isn't just about security. It's also about things like functionality. DARPA would take the binaries and the patches and they would look at the patch and make sure that it retained all the original functionality. After all, if a patch breaks your system, you're not going to want to install it. And finally, they measured performance of the patch. They would look at things like memory overhead, CPU overhead. And so when you looked at this sort of game, it wasn't all about security. It was about making decisions that operated within a confined space to make sure that it wasn't just the most secure, but it was also performant and functional. And to give you an idea, on our system, we determined that if our patches had more than 5% overhead, it was better to play the original buggy binary. Now, many people think of security in this phase of the contest has just ended. People have found exploitable bugs, they patched them, and they're done. But really, that's not how the world works. DARPA changed the direction, I really think, of the community by saying the goal here is to win. And the way you show that you win is that you give people access to your patches. And so DARPA would take our patches and give them to our competitors. And the competitors could do further analysis to go and see if they could circumvent them. They could try to steal our patches and use those patch techniques themselves and submit them back to DARPA round after round. And so what they created is a contest that wasn't just about security in a point in time, but about security as it evolves. It allowed attackers and defenders to learn from each other. And at the end of the contest, 
over 95 rounds to determine a winner. So when we looked at this challenge, we said we had to do three things. First, we need to be able to automatically exploit, soft, exploit software. We had to do what Loki does to find vulnerabilities, and we had to teach a computer to do it. Second, we had to be able to automatically rewrite binaries to add in defenses to prevent them from being exploited. Again, no human required, not something previously done. And third, just as importantly, we had to make better decisions than our opponents. This was huge. So let me talk about how we went about doing the automatic discovery. The first thing that we did is we had to take an off-the-shelf program, one that we didn't have source code to, and perform analysis. So we built what we call the binary analysis platform. It's available for free on GitHub, which allows us to take a binary and raise it up to an intermediate re representation for which you can do program analysis. From that, we created tools to go and find vulnerabilities in software. And let me tell you a little story about how we went about this. That first video I showed you on IWconfig and that first slide, second slide I showed you with the Linux distribution, we used exclusively a technique called symbolic execution. And the reason that we did that is it was a very academically promising technique, something that we could publish papers on, push the frontiers of research on. But what we found during this contest is trying to find the best solution was the wrong thing to do. Instead, what you should do is imply a portfolio of techniques. And so we added to our system the ability to do things like fuzzing, crash exploration. So if you have a crash, obviously the programmer has some sort of mental problem with the world. At that point in the program, he thinks the world's different than it actually is. And so if there's a bug in one place, there's likely a bug nearby as well. And we built a feedback loop between these techniques, which allowed us to find far more vulnerabilities than any single technique alone. For example, at the end of the contest, we found 67% of our bugs with fuzzing and 33% of symbolic execution. But the funny thing is, that's just the output of finding the bugs themselves. What we found is the symbolic executor would often reach and start analyzing a part of a code, then hand that over to a fuzzer, which used a different set of techniques. And it would be the fuzzer that ultimately found the vulnerability, but that was only enabled through the symbolic execution technique. So one of the lessons we learned in this is to build a portfolio of techniques that work cooperatively together is always going to perform, outperform any one single technique. For defense, we had to be able to statically rewrite binaries. And so we used something called data flow analysis as a basis, where we did formal program analysis to be able to understand how a program worked and use that to derive analysis that would rewrite the program. And again, we used a portfolio. We had two techniques. First was something we called hardening. What hardening did is it took a binary and it would rewrite it to introduce essentially seat belts. For those of you in the community who know, we would take a binary and we'd inline control flow integrity, stack canaries, ASLR, DEP, and so on into the binary. Now these are agnostic to whether there's a vulnerability or not, but they make the program safer overall. We then would also, when we found a particular bug, go into the particular lines where the bug occurred and automatically rewrite them to introduce safety checks. And so if you looked at this, we had a portfolio of techniques where actually we could harden a binary and add crash specific patches when we found them but we could also take one specific technique and apply it alone. I'll talk a little bit about that in a second, but first I want to show you how this works in practice. One of the challenges DARPA gave us was based on the SQL Slammer worm. What the machine first did is it started generating automatically regression tests, and the reason that we had to do that is because we had to make sure that when we wrote a binary, we maintained functionality and performance. So we create these regression tests, we'd start patching the binary, creating a hardened binary, and then we'd start replaying those test cases to make sure that we had no performance and functionality lost. When we found particular bugs, we'd go in and rewrite them, and again, we'd replay those test cases that we automatically generated and measure functionality and performance. And then the machine would have to make a decision about which of these solutions to apply. So this is kind of interesting, right? So instead of having just one patch, we had a portfolio of patches from the portfolio of techniques. We would measure them and empirically determine what the best one to deploy at any point in time was. Finally, we had to build something that was completely autonomous. To do this, we didn't know when DARPA started the contest whether they were going to give us 10 programs, 100 programs, or 1,000 programs. And so we had to build in the capability to dynamically scale our environment and dedicate resources where they were going to matter most. For example, if we got a program and we seem to keep finding new bugs in it, it makes sense to devote more resources to that than something we're not finding bugs in. The second thing is we had to make sure that we were playing the game the optimal way. For example, if we created a patch and that patch had, let's say, 5% overhead, we may say that it's too dangerous to play now because that 5% overhead will hurt us in scoring unless we think someone is attacking us. 
Only if we think someone's attacking us would we decide to play it. So in a nutshell, we would do the binary analysis, we'd harden, we'd find exploits, we'd patch. We'd run through a decision process, the machine would run through a decision process where it determined the best security solution it would deploy and it would just iterate this again and again and again. Now in this contest, we faced some of the most notable names in program analysis out there. We faced UC Berkeley, been doing research in this forever. UC Santa Barbara, been doing research in this forever. Large defense contractors like Raytheon that are very well known in the DOD. One of the cool things that I found about this particular approach DARPA had where they had a very open BAA process is you got people who traditionally we hadn't seen much in the community, like the University of Idaho, where a two-person team qualified for the final round, beating out 93 other teams that had registered for the event. So at the end of this contest, for All Secure One, we got the $2 million cash prize, but what was really cool about it is when you looked at it, everyone had little twists on their techniques that were different. And if you look at the scores, you'll notice they're not very far apart. People were competitive. And what this tells me is that the community has built a set of techniques. While in a particular contest, some may be better than others, they're all competitive for autonomously addressing cybersecurity concerns in this sort of environment. So one of the things we did that wasn't advertised at the DARPA Cyber Grand Challenge is the machine then played the best humans in the world. This is the final scoreboard from the DEF CON CTF that followed. And in the CTF, just to give you an idea of the caliber of the sorts of people the machine played against, the number three team, DEF Core, had Loki on it, this person who found three zero days over the course of two days. Now I had built Mayhem as part of For All Secure, and I had also helped found PPP, a human hacking team at CMU. And so I had some insight into what the machine did versus what the humans did. And one of the things I can tell you is, once again, although the machine lost, you'll notice from the scores that it was competitive. In fact, for two out of the three days of the DEF CON CTF, the machine was beating some of the teams. But there are differences. For example, if you look at the humans, the humans have an incredible notion of being able to abstract details. It's something that humans are great at, while the machine has precision going for it. For example, at one point in the contest, PPP was looking at a line of code, thought it may be vulnerable, but couldn't figure out an exploit. The machine was able to calculate an exploit because it had to reason about program branches and the particular program state that was extremely complicated, something that would far exceed human understanding, and it was able to do that in a fraction of a second. The second thing is humans have intuition, and this is extremely important when you hack because you have to decide where to focus your attention. You may think, this part of the code looks extremely tricky, and therefore I'm gonna focus my attention there. While the machine has brute force. Now this idea of brute force sounds perhaps uh, very simple. It's incredibly useful when you're trying to do these things at scale. And the way we see it, from our research point of view, is once a person has an intuition of where to, use, to work, to look, often you can use that brute force as a leverage point. Where the human says, I have an intuition, this is a problem, and then put the machine to look deeply into that place to look for vulnerabilities. Finally, humans have creativity. The machine will only look for vulnerabilities that it's been programmed to look for. Humans aren't restricted. As I said, attackers and defenders get to co-evolve. For example, there's a class of attacks called timing attacks. The way I describe them is as follows. Suppose my wife asked me, do I look fat in these pants? And I took a few seconds to respond. It doesn't really matter what my response is. The amount of time it took me to respond reveals all the information in the world. It's the same way in security often where the amount of time it takes to do something can reveal something about the secret. So humans have this great creativity to invent new classes of attacks. While the machine, once we program it to look for that class of attacks, has enormous scalability where it can start looking at all the programs in the world. So in this talk, there's really been two themes. The first theme is human effort alone does not scale. Apps are being released at too quick of a pace for humans to look at every one. Yet we need something that we're assured has looked at every piece of software for security vulnerabilities. It's just too important not to do. And second, we can teach computers to hack. Humans can take computers and they can teach them to do at least a little bit of what Loki does and apply that to every piece of software in the world. Thank you. <laughs>